Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Boy, I'm telling you, the Lord got in all of that, didn't he? Huh? He jumped right all up in it. Mm, mm, mm. Bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you. And um, I know sometimes, you know, it, it's funny. It's funny because a lot of times, uh, well, all the time, I know that uh, we're praying for the Lord to inhabit the praises of his people. You know, we're, we're praying, all right, Lord, you jump in here and you... Uh, you, you take over, and you, you do whatever you want to do in us. But, you know, isn't it really funny a lot of times when God begins to do that, how nervous we can get about that? You know, I mean, really like, oh, wait, wait a minute, Lord, I, I, didn't, I, I really didn't mean it that, that deep. Come on, I mean, you know, I mean, how about just a little bit? <laughs> because we don't want to get out of bounds right? you know, and all of that, and, uh, and we get all anxious and concerned about whatever it might be. And, and, just, and so the Lord just encourages you to allow him to fill your life and to guide your life and to lead your life and, 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 to, and to focus on him and, and, and the fact that, that he can do anything and that he loves you and that he hears you and that he's actively working in your life. You know, that's, that, that starts, you know, where that, you know where it starts? Right here. That's where it starts, right here in our mind. And our mind has to be transformed. As a matter of fact, let, I, I want to just start with this passage of Scripture right here. This is Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. You've heard it. If you've been in church any of your life, you've, I'm sure you've heard these verses. Uh, how, how, does my, how does my mind change? Well, my mind changes uh, uh, when, when I turn it over to the Lord, and the Lord uh, transforms it. The Word of God says my mind has to be transformed. My mind has to be made new again because it's controlled by the, the world. Look, look at what it says. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, accept, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world. The word, the word here, conformed, that word is the is the word the Greek word for, for conformed is the word from which we get our English word schematic. If you're an engineer or if you're a machinist or if you're a mechanic or you work with plans in any way or buildings or uh, apparatus, you you guys know what a schematic is. A schematic is a is a picture or a diagram or a drawing that shows in drawing form what happens with the product of these machineries or how this runs through here and the, uh, where it goes and what's next and, or some electrical circuit or whatever, whatever the schematic might be showing. It, what, it's, what it's doing is it's showing an, an identical copy of what's happening in the working of this product or this design. So what the Lord is saying to us is when, when you think identically to the world, when you think based on what the world thinks about things, you are an exact identical replica of what the world thinks and the way the world acts. And so, and so if that's the way you are, you, you, you're not, you're not going to be able to present your bodies. You're not going to be able to be a holy sacrifice as long as you are identical in the way you think with the world. So the Apostle Paul is saying, uh, you're going to have to have a new way of thinking. That's yeah. what's going on. You can't, you can't think like the world thinks and, and present your body and be a living sacrifice. Yeah. And so what has to happen is, in order for you to be that, your mind has to be transformed. Mm -hmm. And the word transformed, and I'm not trying to sound like you know, some kind of dictionary, but, but you know, these words do matter, right? <laughs> words matter. And the word transformed here. Uh, it comes from the Greek word uh, uh, metamorpho. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, it, it means it, you've seen the word metamorpho. It, 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 that sounds just like the English word we get from it, metamorphosis. To met, a metamorphosis means a complete trans, uh, trans, uh, a, 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 a complete change, transformation in life. <laughs> I get caught up. Uh, it, 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 uh, the, the logo for metamorphosis is what? A butterfly, right? You have a, you, you have a butterfly. Well, a butterfly is a caterpillar, right? Well, a caterpillar goes into a cocoon, and when he comes out, he's no longer a caterpillar. What is he? He's a butterfly, right? In other words, he got 
totally transformed. He, he, I mean, he goes in a wiggly little worm and he comes out with beautiful wings and no one would even recognize that he had ever been a caterpillar before. He's so completely transformed. So the apostle Paul through the Holy Spirit is saying that if you're not going to represent the world and you're not going to think like the world and you're not going to live like the world and you're not going to be an identical copy of the world, then your mind is going to have to be totally transformed. And how is that mind totally transformed? By the renewing of your mind, by, by, by God changing and transforming the, the way you think about Christ and the way you think about life. So let me put it to you this way. When you trusted Christ and you let the Lord come into your life, you got a new eternal address. When you said yes to Jesus, when you said, Lord, change my life completely, God gave you a heavenly address. 101 Glory Boulevard. But though you have a heavenly address, it's amazing how you can still live such an earthly life while you're on the way to that new address in heaven. You're living an earthly life, and that earthly life is robbing you of joy, of peace, of, of the presence of God, the enjoyment of your family. So in order to get victory over worry and anxiety and fear, which we're looking at today, um, you have to learn to think a different way. Because as long as you think like the world, you're going to have the same problems that the world has. The world is filled with fear. The world is, world is filled with anxiety. The, word is, the world is filled with conflict and, and regret and loss and, and pain and all of that. And if you think like the world, you're going to experience pain like that and worry like that. But if you'll let the Holy Spirit transform uh, completely metamorphize <laughs> a word made up, then you can be different. And so what will the Lord do? Let's just look at anxiety and, and um, fear and worry just quickly. Let me give you just a quick little definition so we'll be able to know what I'm talking about because, you know, they really worry, anxiety, and fear are very similar to each other, really. They come from, the I think, a similar root. Uh, brings all of these forward. Of course, they're different in their intensity because worry is the least invasive. And, but worry can escalate itself up to anxiety, right? And then it's not, it's not very far from anxiety to fear, and, and it just escalates itself. So, so worry, anxiety, and fear basically have the same root. It, it's just a difference of intensity in how we experience. And even within what they are. Worry, as an example, means to mentally dwell on difficulty or trouble, to have a, to have a, to have a chronic uh, concern uh, uh, concerning some difficulty in life or some per and, and to just dwell on that and keep that in your mind. And of course, there are different intensities of that in, within being worried sometimes, uh, let's say it goes from the extreme of, let's say, weather to weddings. So we're concerned about the weather, what's going to happen, how it's going to be, hot or cold, blah, blah. All right, so we can worry about minute things and things that aren't big like weather, or we can escalate. The other extreme would be worry about events in our life, like weddings. Oh, are we ready? Is this going to happen? Is it going to be a catastrophe? Blah, blah, blah. So you can experience difficulty with that. Anxiety is defined as being, un being uneasy and nervous about an event, a person, or a problem that I can't control. I'm anxious because I can't control the outcome of what's going to happen here. I want to control it. I would feel better if I could control it, but because I can't control it, I'm nervous about it. I'm anxious about it because I can't control it. It's out of my, it's out of my control. How many, of you, how, many, how many of you have a favorite football team, pro or college? You, you, but you have one, right? Yeah, Deb, Deb I, you don't even have to raise your hand. <laughs> the saints. <laughs> well, how many of you get nervous when you're watching your team that you love play? 
Yeah, you know why you get nervous and anxious? Because you want to be able to control the outcome of what happens, but you can't control it, so it produces anxiety in your life. And so within anxiety, we can experience anxiety. Just, let's just say one extreme would be worrying about who's going to win the football game, and the uh, other extreme would be uh, for me to worry about who's going to get laid off in my company, you know. My company's having layoffs, and I'm all anxious about it because I don't know if, it, if it's me. I have no control over that, and I'm nervous. So it's just different intensities and different levels of that. And fear, fear is a negative emotion that is caused by real or perceived threat to our well-being. Uh, of course, there are different intensities of fear. Uh, let's just say from poodle to pit bull, all right? Yeah, those are the extremes. Many of you know that I worked for AT&T for several years, and I was a service technician. And what that means is I have to go wherever the equipment is, if it's in somebody's house or if it's in a business or wherever it is, it's up a pole or in an attic, wherever it is. I had to go there to fix it, repair it, put it in. Well, that meant I encountered lots of uh, animals, uh, let's just say. You know, people's houses are filled with animals. Did you know that? I am amazed at how many people have pets in their house. Matter of fact, it's odd for somebody not to have one in their house. So I, I'm just saying that I've encountered a lot of pets. And uh, a lot of times I encountered these little poodle dogs or little small dogs. Well, they were always barking and always kind of looking, you know, menacing, you know. But that really wasn't a problem. I, I, I could come in and they'd just be, you know, and I looked like they'd eat me up. But I wasn't fearful of them because they're tiny, you know. And if those little fellas get out of control, you know, then they might, they might bite on my little britches legs here, you know, something like that. And uh, does the word feel go, you know, mean anything to you? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a bad pastor, bad pastor. <laughs> Pastor talking about hurting the dog. Y'all know I'm kidding about that. I wouldn't feel go lean by his dog uh, while they were there. Uh, anyway, yeah. But anyway, but but you didn't. I didn't worry about them because you know the worst they could do is scratch me up and blah blah blah. But if you had a pit bull in your house, that was a whole nother experience right there. In other words, that was a whole different produ production in your life. Uh, you would be fearful because if that booger gets loose. He can do some, he can tear your arm off or your leg or whatever else it might be. So, uh, in other words, uh, worry uh, has levels, anxiety has levels, and fear. And, and they're all about uh, the fact that um, we can't control the outcome and we, we don't know what's going to happen. Now, let me just say to you next that worry, anxiety, and fear are not normal. Let me just say it again. Worry, anxiety, and fear are not normal. They're common, but they're not normal. What is normal? Jesus is normal. For a child of God, Jesus is normal. <laughs> Everything else is not normal in our life. And I, I think one of the reasons why there's so much anxiety and worry and fear is because we've become convinced that all of that is just normal. That we, we, we don't even try to fight it or move it or come against it because we're convinced that everybody worries, everybody's filled with anxiety, everybody's afraid. So we accept it because we think it's normal. I'm just telling you that it's not normal. You can't look at it as normal. Jesus is normal. <laughs> what you just worshiped and said and praised, that's, that's normal to a child of God. That's our normal life. He's the greatest. He loves us. He can provide everything. He's in control of everything. He knows what's going on, and he cares about what's going on, and he can move in your life. That's normal. Everything else is not normal, and it's not inevitable that you're going to have this. We've also been convinced that it not only is it normal, but it's inevitable. You don't have any control over it. And because we allow it to stay in our life, you know why it's there? Because we allow it to stay there. We, we, we just, we, we don't come against it. We, we just accept it as part of the common experience of life. And so, you know what it does? It robs us. It robs us of our fellowship with God. It robs us of our worship of Him. It, it robs us of our peace. It robs us of our joy. It robs us of our time, our fellowship with our family, 
How many times in the midst of the people that you really love, does anxiety or fear or worry pop into the situation and you're distracted from enjoying the time with the ones, the very ones you love because all of a sudden now you're worried about something or you're anxious about something or something popped up a bit that, that you're concerned about and it just robs you and it exists because we allow it to exist. Do you know in the scripture that we are commanded? God says, do not do this. Do not. Do not fear. I command you, don't fear. I command you not to be anxious. I command you not to worry about anything, about anything in our life. And this is really important. Now catch this. He commands us not to worry, not to be anxious, and don't fear. And, and here's what I want you to remember. If we couldn't live like that, God would never say that to us. Because God would not command us to do something that we cannot do. How evil would that be? I command you to do this always, all the time, knowing that we didn't have the power to do what he commanded. No, 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 no. no. God would not command us to live like this if we couldn't absolutely have the ability to obey that command in life. So then, how do we change our mind? How do we come against worry, anxiety, and fear? I mean, we're in it. We're in, in the holidays right now. You know, we're going to be together with our families quite a bit, and and it just sometimes you just get nervous when you start thinking about that, and and you think, man, oh my goodness, and. And you get fearful and anxious and, and, and all upset. How, how, would, how would your mind be transformed? Well, I've got the three suggestions, and they're in your notes. I don't even think we had a blank in there. Do we, Tan? We didn't put a blank in there. Okay, so you're not going to have to write anything down. So let me just show you. Here they are. Number one, consider worry, anxiety, and fear as agents of the enemy to destroy your life and rob your joy. All right, let me, let me make two theological statements right now, right off the bat. Number one, God created us to live in peace, not in fear. We are, we are created to live in peace. In Genesis 1, when we were created, where were we placed? In a beautiful garden, right? A paradise is what the Bible calls it. And what happened in that paradise was every day God came and God fellowshiped with us. God walked with us. God, 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 God interacted with us. Peace. And so we crave peace. We, we desire peace. We flourish in an atmosphere of peace. So we were created to live in peace, not in fear. Here's the second theological statement. As much as you know the presence of God by peace, you know the presence of Satan by fear. When you're at peace in life, peace in situations, you sense the presence of God because God inhabits that peace. God creates that peace. Peace is where God lives. And when we have peace, we, we're right with God. We're, we're in touch with God. We feel and sense God. But when fear comes in, all of a sudden, no, no, no. This doesn't, this doesn't compute. We get anxious. We get worried. We get fearful. And this is where the presence of the devil is, is found. And let me just say this to you, that God would never use fear to try to motivate you. God doesn't live in fear. God doesn't use fear to motivate you. Preachers might. Turn or burn, get right or get left. Change your stroke or go up and smoke, you know. Yeah, that's fearful, Right? You better, you better do this or you're going to burn in your eternity. That's fear. That's motivating by fear. God doesn't do that. God doesn't, mo God doesn't ever motivate by fear. So God says, look, I, I, I don't want you to be afraid. You know the most common commandment in the Bible? Fear not. God says that 63 times. 63 times in the Bible. God says, fear not. What does that show you about God? It shows you God doesn't want us to live that way. That God does not intend for us to live in fear. 
So, so look at Philippians, uh, just the first part of Philippians. Be an- Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing. <laughs> That's the command. Don't be anxious about anything. What is that saying? That is saying to us that we absolutely have the ability to live without being anxious about one single thing. Fear is an enemy of our life. It robs and steals from us. Anxiety is an enemy of our life. Don't be anxious about this, God says. Because anxiety, according to to the medical associations, is the number one cause for sickness and disease in this country. Anxiety is the number one cause of prescribed medicine in this country. Anxiety is the number one cause Uh, cause for doctor's office visits in this country because it's an enemy. It's a killer on every level, and and it it actually shortens our life. So fear is an enemy. Uh, Anxiety is uh, is an enemy. Look, Look at it. Again, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then this verse out of Matthew 6, Matthew 6, he says, Therefore I say to you, don't be anxious for your life. Don't be anxious about what you eat. Don't be anxious about what you'll drink, nor about what kind of raiment you put on your body. And then a few verses later in verse 34, he says, And and don't be anxious about tomorrow either. Because I, tomorrow's got enough care for its own. And remember, if we couldn't do this, God wouldn't be telling us to do it because he would never ask us to do something that we couldn't do. Uh, I remember as a child, I don't know about you how your life was when you were being brought up, but I can remember as a child, I was the oldest uh, child of four, and I had lots of worries in life. I don't know if you were brought up in that kind of an environment. I had plenty to worry about because my father was an alcoholic. My mother was an operating room nurse, which meant she was on call all the time, many hours away from us and the family and the home. And there were four of us children, and we were very poor. My parents now, even though my dad was an alcoholic, he worked very hard. He went to work. And he, he earned what he could. And my, and my mom uh, earned everything she could. And they provided for us. So the necessities of life, we had food and, you know, that kind of stuff. But, but we didn't have the frills. But to give you an example, I was 13 years old before I had a bed, much less a bedroom. <laughs> I slept in the hall. Yeah, with a fan, right? A little box fan about this big on, on a pile of blankets down there because my dad worked in a truck stop and he, these, these blankets that are used to put between, you know, furniture or something like that, those kind of thick things. That's what I slept on every night until I was 13 years old. So I had a lot of anxiety and I had a lot of stress and I had a lot of worry, a lot of fear in my life. Well, you know what this produced in me? As, as I got older and older, uh, as, as I got older and older, I, I got more and more uh, anxious. And to just confess the end of where it goes, when I was in the eighth grade, uh, I had to be hospitalized for this. It was such an extreme. And thank God they, they, could, they could take me somewhere and actually introduced to me something that was helpful. Now, I wasn't a Christian. Nobody in my family was a Christian. We didn't know the Lord. And uh, all I knew is I could not function. And what I'm, what I'm saying to you is I didn't have a physical problem. I had an emotional problem. But that emotional problem led to a physical problem where I had to be hospitalized in order to, to get that uh, straightened out. Well, you won't be surprised to know that out of that kind of sense of uh, anxiety, it caused relational problems too. Because this is hard to understand, but, it, but it's true. On one hand, I wanted to please people. And on the other hand, I wanted to control people. 
Is that not weird? <laughs> I, was, I, I, I had the people-pleasing spirit on one side of me, and I had the control freak spirit on the other side of me, and, and, and it, it, it had, I had problems because of that, and all this was just swirling around inside of me. And I came to the Lord when I was 16 years old, and then I surrendered to the ministry when I was 18 years old. And let me just say to you, it, if you're filled with anxiety and fear and worry, the, entering the ministry is like jumping out of the frying pan into, into, into the fire because the ministry is filled with people. So the fear of man, the fear of failure, the fear of rejection, the anxiety about money, the anxiety about uh, your family having enough, worry about everything. Yeah, worry. See, I'm, I'm saying worry and anxiety and fear are robbers in your life. They kill, they destroy. They, they, they mess up everything in the life and they are not normal. And God says you have to deal with these things in life as enemies and you have to count them as enemies so they're in your life because you allow them to stay in your life. Here's the second suggestion. Number two, turn every anxious and worrisome thought into a prayer that you pray until you receive peace. Every anxious and worrisome thought, I'm going to pray over it until I get victory. Now, I, I know this may sound unusual because we don't hear this word anymore, but all you older ones will remember, that's what we used to call praying through. You, you've heard that phrase, right? We're going we're gonna to pray through. Well, pray through means I'm going to pray and keep on praying until I sense some kind of peace in this situation. We looked at the first little line of Philippians 4 a moment ago. Let, let's look at, w at what else it says. Uh, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. All right, let's, let's don't be religious here a moment. Let's don't be churchy here a moment. Let's just be practical, all right? By being practical, I mean, let's just, let's just call it what it is so we don't, we don't get all wrapped up in trying to be spiritual about these things and, and, and all churchy and, and the activities involved around these, you know, these, uh, these ceremonial kind of stuff like prayer, you know, where people think about prayer as going to an altar and kneeling down. Thou highest one of the glory and the wonder and the majesty, thou that reigneth on high, and thou, you know, that kind of stuff. So when you get up in the morning, don't have a prayer list. I mean, don't write prayer list on the top of it. Write, uh, write uh, this is what's bothering me, <laughs> you know. This is what's bothering me on top. Have you ever tried to pray and you just, as you were trying to pray, your, your mind wandered? Have you ever had that? Uh, do you know what your, what your mind wandered to is the thing that you need to be pray, praying about? <laughs> yeah, but we get all, we, we, we're, we, we're, we're sitting there, we're trying to pray, and we're thinking about all kinds of things that are bothering us, and you're trying to be spiritual, and you're trying to pray, and you're trying to pray these nice religious prayers. What I'm suggesting to you is that in your life, you will either pray or you will worry about things. So God says, look, instead of having a life filled with things that you worry about, why don't you just bring them and lay them before me and we, can, and, and we together can take care of these things in life. And he tells us how to do it. Look in verse 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. You know what that word supplication means? It means, it means anything that will help me uh, pray better. It means if fasting will help me pray better, then, then, then fast when you pray. If worship being the Lord will help me 
pray more effectively, then while we're praying, worship, uh, play some worship and get into some worship. If reading the Bible helps me be more effective in my prayer life, then while I'm praying, read some word of God. So he's just saying, be, don't be anxious for anything. But when you go to the Lord in prayer, take with you anything that's going to help you be more effective in, in praying. And then, and, and then he said, uh, and with thanksgiving, let your requests be na- made known to God. What does he mean, with thanksgiving? I know most of us probably would think, all right, what that saying is, when we go to the Lord in prayer, we just need to start thanking the Lord for everything he's done in our life. Just generally, basically saying, Lord, thank you for what you've done in my life, and I lay before you my anxiety. You know, and people, I mean, you, you would think that, but that's not what it means. It's not that general. It's not just general, Lord, just thank you for everything you did in my life. With thanksgiving means be specific. It means every time I go to the Lord in prayer and I'm praying about what bothers me, what I'm concerned about. I got a meeting today with this malcontent, and I don't know how this meeting is going to turn out, and I'm anxious about it. I'm doing, or I've got a meeting with my boss today, or I've got to, I've got to be around somebody that I don't like, or we, I'm worried about what's going to be discussed at the Thanksgiving table. I mean, whatever it is that's bothering you, Whatever you're worried about, whatever you're focused about in life, that's what you need to pray for. Not the missionaries in China and the, and, and, and the kids in, the, you know, in Afghanistan or somewhere. I mean, it's good to pray for things like that. But if something's really bothering you, you need to pray. You need to, you need to lay it before the Lord and you don't need to be churchy and spiritual. About, you just need to be clean about the thing and say, God, this is what's bothering me today. And with thanksgiving means that I thank the Lord specifically for the fact that he loves me, that he is hearing me, and that he's going to answer my prayer. Lord, I thank you that you are hearing what I'm saying right now. I thank you that you love me enough to care about what I'm saying right now. And Lord, I I, I know you are already doing this in my life because you know what things I have need of. But I love you and I thank you and I'm coming before you right now asking you about this thing that's bothered me and worrying me, Lord. Can we do something about that today? Can that, can that be changed and altered? Lord, thank you that you're already working in my life. This is what Jesus taught us in John 11. Remember Jesus in John 11, Lazarus gets raised from the dead. And remember what Jesus did? Jesus went to his tomb and Jesus started praying to the Father and then right in the middle of, of, of John chapter 11, Jesus says, Father, I thank you that you hear me and hear what I'm saying. And then he said, look, it's not because I don't think you hear me, but it's because of everybody around listening, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I thank you that you hear me because I know that you always hear me. And it was based on the fact that Jesus had a heavenly father that he prayed to and ask his father to work in the situation that he was doing down here. Even Jesus said, I got a heavenly father, and I'm laying this before my heavenly father, and I'm thanking him in advance that he's going to do because he loves me and he cares for me, and he's going to provide for my life, and he's told me to, to don't be anxious about anything, but with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let my request be made known to God. So our prayer is, you know everything that's going on in my life. You care about it, and I'm thankful right now that you're hearing my, this prayer, and you're going to answer me from heaven. And then you walk through that day not worried about whether God's going to do it, but thanking God because you know he's the best daddy in the universe. Yeah, you're the best daddy in the universe, and you care about me and love me. And he says, when you do that, you're going to have a miracle happen in your life. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, is going to come into your mind and your feelings. Yeah, yeah. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall guard. That word guard there means uh, to put a a military guard around it. In other words, God says, uh, when you you, uh, you 
are anxious for nothing and you pray about it and you lay it before God and you thank God for he, what he's doing even in advance, that, that God is going to do something and it's going to create peace in your life that passes your ability to understand it. I call it dumb peace. You know why it's dumb peace? Because when, uh, when people see it and when you see it, you say, I don't understand what happened. So you're either dumb or you have peace, one or the other. I mean, the world looks at you and says, man, are, are you just so dumb you don't understand how terrible this stuff is? <laughs> hmm. What do you own, man? What kind of substance? Hook a brother up. What do you own? I'm on peace. That's what I'm on. You can have all the peace you want, yeah, because God has brought me this peace. So, so when I pray about it, uh, he says, what this peace is going to do for me is perform a miracle in my life. Uh, the word that is used there is the word uh, phreo, which means to put a guard like a, a military guard around my life. And, and so don't be anxious for anything, but in everything with prayer and more prayer, let your requests go to God with thanksgiving. Thank him that he loves you. Thank him that he's listening. Thank, thank him that he's going to do it. And the peace of God, which passes understanding, you won't even be able to understand you have, why you have so much peace in your life. But, he, but, but the peace of God is going to set up a military guard around your, it says, hearts, Everybody say, my feelings and minds. Everybody say, my thoughts. So what is he saying? He's saying, you know, when you pray like this, you go to God. You lay these things before and you thank God and you go like that. God's going to put peace in your life and peace in your mind that's going to be like a military guard around your thoughts and your feelings so that Satan can't come in there and plant fear and worry and anxiety in your thoughts and your feelings of life. And the peace of God, that brings peace of God in my life. You're not an orphan. You're the most well-fathered person in the universe, which brings us to number three. Look at it. By faith, believe and confess that God is your loving dad and he will always care for you. Now, this might be hard for some people. And let's just go ahead and admit it. Some people have had relationships with their earthly dad that are terrible. They don't really know what a father is. When they think about a father, they think about a father that beats them, a father that's a hypocrite, a father that, that's unconcerned, a father that doesn't represent care and love at all. He represents control, anger, pain, hostility. And it's going to be a little bit, maybe it's a little stretch for you, a little difficult for you to, under, to, to, to grasp the fact that you have a father. You're, you're not an orphan. I used that phrase just a moment ago, uh, what I'm talking about by an orphan. You, did you know that the enemy tries to insert into your life the spirit of an orphan? By an orphan, you know what I mean. I mean somebody that has no mother or father, right, who is alone in this world. I know some of you in this church have been physical orphans. You, didn't, you ran away from home or you didn't have a home or your mom and dad didn't, weren't in the home and you were an orphan which gave you a, a, a spirit that said, I've got, to, I've got to provide for myself and I've got to do things on my own and if I don't take care of myself, nothing else, is, no one else is going to take care of me and the devil wants you to think that in the, in the spirit that you are an orphan. And that you don't have a heavenly father and you don't have to, uh, and you're going to have to take care of everything on your own. And if it's going to happen for you, it's going to happen because you get out there and make it happen. And that's the spirit. That's the spirit of an orphan, an orphan spirit. And that's what the enemy wants to place in your life. Did you know that Jesus was very concerned about the fact that we wouldn't sense that we were orphans when he left this earth? A great deal of what Jesus said right before he left this earth, is about us not feeling like orphans. John 14, one of my favorite books and chapters in the Bible, it starts like this. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll surely come again, and I'll receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you might be also. You're not orphans. 
I'm coming back. But because he was so concerned with the fact that in the meantime, we might sense that we're orphans, which would throw us as easy prey to an enemy who would take advantage of that spirit. He goes on to say in that same 14th chapter, he said, but even though I'm going away, I'm not going to leave you without a father. But I'm going to send a comforter into your life, which will be better than me, actually, because he will not just live around you. He will live inside of you. So you're not an orphan, I, I, and I'm going to make sure you're not an orphan because I don't want the enemy taking that orphan spirit and creating an opportunity for you to have all kind of pain in your life. And so look at what he said in John 14. He said, right before verse 16, he said, um, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I'll pray the Father, and he'll give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Who is that other comforter? Verse 17, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I'll come to you. So that orphan spirit is, is an enemy to our peace. And it's designed by the enemy to intimidate us and to create fear in our lives. You have the best father in the universe God says, stop grieving about what you don't have and start looking at what you do have and say, thank God I got the best daddy in the world. And, and let me tell you this, and God loves being a dad. God wants to be your father. God wants to take care of you. In Matthew 6, you know, all those promises, don't worry about anything, don't be anxious about anything, about what you eat, what you say, what you want, what you're going to wear, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Do you know that all of those commands are given in the context of God being our Heavenly Father? Every one of them are saying, don't worry, you got a Heavenly Father. Don't worry because, I mean, don't be full of care, you got a Heavenly Father. Don't be anxious about anything because you got a daddy up in heaven that's going to take care of you. You read that sixth chapter of Matthew, and you'll see over and over and over again, all of those promises are based on the fact that we've got a Heavenly Father that's the greatest Father in the universe and can do anything, and He wants to be our dad. Amen. You know, Tanya and I have two children and uh, eight grandchildren. I absolutely love being a dad. With Justin and Amy, I love being a dad. And I wanted to do everything for my children that I possibly could because I love them and I wanted to take care of their lives. And if they needed something, if they, wanted, if they, if they needed me there, I was there. If they needed me to provide, I provided. If they needed something, I would get out and work or do or provide it somehow because I'm their dad and I love them and I want them to be provided for. And as a granddad, I'm going to say that I'm the same way. Now, I growl like a grumpy old bear and I, you know, I, I kind of snort around and all of that kind of stuff. But I'm telling you that I absolutely love to provide for, for my grandchildren. Um, I, I, I still have that spirit of a, of a dad within me, and I, I want to help them. I want them to prosper. I want them to do well. I want to I move roadblocks out of their life. I want to I fix and mend things that are going on in their life. And I love being that, and, and, and I'm evil compared to, to, compared to God. I want to do all of that, and I'm, and I'm evil compared to God. So if I want to do that, imagine how much more God wants to do that for those who will let him be their father in life. God adores, can I tell you, God adores you. I didn't, you know, that, that is, that is, that's a concept that many of us don't have. I'm almost 60, well, I'll be 64 in March. I'm 64, I've been in the ministry 45 years. I'm just coming to that conclusion. Is that, is that pitiful? That's pitiful, isn't it? That I, I come to the conclusion that I have a heavenly father that loves me so much and loves being a dad so much 
that if I will just let him, he will be my father. And he will provide for me because he loves doing it. That's his desire. He said, I care about you. I'll, I'll take care of anything. Look, uh, just, just, let me, let me, just, just let me do it, all right? Uh, quit trying to do it yourself and let dad take care of that. If you'll, if you'll get out of the way, your father in heaven will take care of this issue for you. But I'm not going to get in there and take care of it if you're right in there in the middle of it trying to take care of it yourself. Let me do it. it nothing's too big. Nothing's too small. Nothing is too minute. I just enjoy the ride. I just love being your father. I, I love doing what, what, I, what, I, what a dad does. And so here we're sitting here addressing something that, that Satan has just thrown up to intimidate us. And what we're doing is we're wasting our relationship, our fellowship with God. I don't mean to be rude by saying this next thing, but if Bill Gates was your father, you would never again worry about money, would you? Well, do you know that your heavenly father has enough money to buy Bill Gates about 10 times over again and never even exhaust the, 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 the pocket change he, he has? Yeah. And he's the one that said, uh, I'm going I'm to take care, let daddy take care of it. Uh, therefore, don't be anxious. Uh, last little verse here, Matthew. Therefore, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. Don't fear you have the best daddy in the universe. And his greatest delight and his greatest joy is to father you through all of these things that are necessary in your life. And he is the answer to every problem in life. All right, bow with me. Let's